Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And a very good day to everyone So, welcome back to our lecture After um, about 3 weeks of delay Okay, so we have 2 weeks of um, holidays um, Christmas and New Year And now, um, and last week you had your exams um, So, what I will do next Is to try and speed up the process uh, And therefore, there's like almost no activity because normally what I do for my lectures uh, especially for master's lectures are to have uh, a little bit of lecture and then uh, some kind of activity like an embedded tutorial inside the lectures but since we cannot do that um, due to lack of time so what we'll do now is try and just you know push through and um, hoping that you guys will be able to cover um, the minimum okay so the minimum requirement um, we will still touch all the um, learning outcomes okay um, but so learning outcomes is based on um, the uh, MQF forms or if you look at your spectrum they are um, forms like cost uh, cost information and performer okay so those are if you look at those documents so it will uh, mention about the learning outcome the learning objectives of um, this course okay so I will push through um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to cover everything okay um, all right so um, attendance uh, is not compulsory for today since um, it's a pre-recorded so I'll just keep the um, attendance um, slide okay moving on to straight away to the tentative schedule Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we had uh, week number eight, so we were able to, or, or at least we, we were able to go through some introduction about um, chromatography and HPLC, okay, but uh, that, that, that particular section also was um, impacted by um, Dr. Magunda's um, one hour, um, was it lecture, if I'm not mistaken, it was a lecture, okay. So Dr. Mungda took one hour from that particular, about one and a half hours from our first week of our um, lecture. And then uh, we also covered week number nine. Okay, so we, we covered pretty much all the introduction of HPLC lecture. Um, we covered a little bit about modes of HPLC. Okay, um, I will touch again a bit of the modes uh, for today's lecture in a bit, a bit detail, but it's more related to the um, column of um, the HPLC system okay um, I give out your assignments okay so if you're talking about the assignment assignment is due um, on week 14 so next week um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, I'll, I will open the link okay um, from it's very unfortunate for you guys because the lecture is on Friday so it's pretty much the last day of, of the whole week of the whole semester so since i mentioned that um the assessment uh, can be submitted on week 14 so i will open the link um starting from monday next week okay until friday so you can submit your like uh assignment friday before the lecture okay so um, the link will close at 5 30 pm on this coming Friday okay oh no not not today of course next week okay so um, that is the only limitation that I put in why because I need some time to actually um, read and mark okay um, if everybody sends um, 10 pages of assignment then I have about uh, times like 14 of you guys so quite a lot of pages to read and to mark um, and um, the more time I have, um, the better chance for me to give um, like a better, um, well distributed mark. Okay, all right. Um, so moving on to the tentative schedule, um, what we will do today is um, we will look at. Um, um, so uh, I actually plan to skip on theory and phases okay so it's just um, you, the component will just be embedded under column so um, 
theory of HPLC uh, we cover a little bit on uh, in the introduction section uh, like following HPLC is pretty much um, the theory behind it follows exactly um, column chromatography okay on top of that all the chromatograms theory and whatnot um, have also been covered under uh, Dr. Mugunda's lecture um, so pretty much GC and HPLC are almost identical uh, except for the fact that um, the detectors are different um, the, the modes or, or the transport system are different instead of a gas this one is a liquid um, additionally what else uh, um, of course the equipment itself is different okay so um, I think it's fine for me to just um, skip on um, that particular bit um, well I've touched it a little bit here and there I've touched some of it um, in today's lecture as well so um, hoping that we will co we'll be able to cover everything okay and and mostly during the lectures um, when when uh, the topic is like very simple like theory and phases what I will embed there is um, some activities um, to enhance your understanding um, but because we do have enough time so I, I think I'll, I'll just skip it altogether depending on if we do, we do have uh, extra time then I will cover it but otherwise um, you know I will just stop there and make sure that um, you, you covered pretty much all the basics of HPLCs um, well, a little bit more detail of course okay so um, and supposedly column is on week 11 but week 11 is actually on the uh, 1st of January so it's a public holiday um, that one uh, the, the first column was supposed to be on the, um, that one is on Christmas uh, another public holiday so um, you know public holiday we are not obliged to um, replace the lecture but and, and because the lecture is a bit long, so um, you know, trying to find a time where um, I can actually you know, record a three hour long lecture and, and time for you guys to actually listen to it. Um, so I'm not sure if I can find that. So therefore, you know, again, as I mentioned, I will just probably you know, skip on, on that one and we will see how it goes. Week 12, um, last time, so this is another disruption. Um, normally, you know, I have all time slots for all the lectures and then um, a final exam is on a different um, time altogether. But since it's an online learning and um, we as lecturer are encouraged to um, not put all the exams during the exam week. So therefore, we embed, um, you know, the exam or uh, or written over here is the summative assessment okay so it's basically we're talking about the exam the final exam okay so we embedded um, the summative assessment in week 12 last week which you have completed so well done um, but the issue with that is that there's a lot of time um, being consumed by by this particular assessment so um, like last week if, if you notice uh, you took almost two hours of the whole um, week okay so the whole lecture session two hours from that because normally what i do is one hour of quiz and then followed by lecture so i still have more time to actually you know cover or, or do a catch-up session but since week 12 is gone with just exam and assessment so um i cannot do anything so we, we really really don't have enough time so uh what we will do today so this is the proposed uh tentative schedule initially but now um it's changed so what we will do today is to look at column um, uh, HPLC column um, altogether we're not looking at the theory uh, we will look at the uh, more on the column aspect of it um, and not on how column influence the chromatogram okay because that issue like Vandermeer equations and effect of Vandermeer in very detail what is Vandermeer and what not has been covered in Dr. Muguna's lecture so even though you have sit for your final exam please do not forget about it okay so it's it's, it's still part of the component for HPLC um, okay so for today uh, lecture 
the ones that I prepared is we will talk about column chromatography, uh, about the the HPSC column itself, and um, so oops, so this one will be on week thirteen, while the lecture that was supposed to be on week thirteen will be pushed to week fourteen. All right, so uh, this is what I mean by you do not have um any presentation. Um, so the the initial idea is for you to have a presentation, uh, but since you know we need to to do all this, I need to reorganize all the um learning experience. Um, therefore I decided to introduce quiz, all right. So that's why you have a quiz over here, and you don't have a presentation. Okay, so the two assessment um that you have now is your written assessment about detector, and the second one is um your quiz. Okay, so the, just those two, um, and um, on week fifteen, okay, I will need to um, you know, mark everything. So that's why I said, if possible, uh, well, not not no no longer. It's it's no longer if possible. Okay, you will need to submit your um written assessment by five thirty a.m. on Friday. Okay. So that's that's the bare minimum. Otherwise, I won't accept it. Um, uh, assignment at all, because I still need to mark it, and on week fifteen, I need to um, you know, post um a grade uh for your continuous assessment. So this quiz and um uh, written assignment, okay. So these two are part of your continuous assessment, and I need to post your grade. Pretty much like it will reflect on how much you actually get. Um, by week four fifteen, okay, I need to do this. So uh, I need some time to actually read and and uh, do the marking. All right, and um, finally your final exam will be during exam week. Um, it will just be a one hour exam. Um, with, uh, I would say plus um half an hour, for um submission. Um, but otherwise you know um. I'm hoping that we will be able to follow through, um, the the current schedule that I'm planning for. All right, so um, enough about introduction. Let's move on to our third lecture. Okay, very funny, but it's it's actually third lecture, third long lecture. Um, we will talk about HPLC columns and um the current trend in in the um uh, industry. All right. I'm hoping this is the current trend in industry at least, um, because what I know is on trends, um, not in the industrial usage, uh, but more on um what is currently available in the industry. Okay, so general uh, information about column. So, what I'm gonna talk about for the whole lecture is um an add-on section, uh, about column. This is what, as what I mentioned. So all the theories and. How the column influence the chromatogram and whatnot. The theory behind that, um, will not be covered. Okay, so uh, it's an add on material, because, uh, I believe Dr. Muguna have covered um all those uh, aspects, um during your GC lecture. So, today is just an add on on that, uh, with particular focus on HPLC columns. Okay, so um some information that you need to recall. Is the Van der Meer equation okay? How it influence uh, Michi TP, um, about column efficiency, plate number, plate height, um, what else? Plate number, plate heights. So the more the more critical things. Okay, so it's it's all related. Okay, you see it's it's the same thing about GC and HPLC because both of them are stereo chromatography. So the basic principle behind those two technologies or behind these two technologies are still similar. Okay, and of course, I will not be touching about the chromatogram. Um, there there will be some examples about chromatogram, but I won't be I won't be specifically touching about you know if you have this and this and this. Um, the chromatogram will do like this. Okay, like the band broadening, peak heights, and whatnot. So I won't be touching those um particular specifics. Okay, so just try and recall. Um, if you can remember, then of course go and rewatch. The Muguda's lecture about um column. Alright, so a typical HPLC column um is a stainless steel tube filled with small particle packing. 
So pretty much uh, what you have is Imagine that this is the um, a normal chromatography uh, Column chromatography that you use in the lab Okay, uh, Because uh, I've, if I recall correctly um, All of you guys have a chemistry background Okay, so you remember at one point of your um, learning experience, you are actually handling column chromatography. Okay, remember the, the very big, long column, and then you uh, premix a silica gel, and then you pour the silica gel into the column. Okay, so it's, it's basically, that's the most typical, that's the most basic um, HPRC column. But to make sure that um, the column can handle high pressure, what was changed is from a glass um, column into a standard steel tube okay so as, as shown in this picture so this is the standard steel tube um, but what changed now is that um, we, based on the influence of van der Meer equation and the back pressure equation and whatnot um, the, some companies actually pr uh, now producing um, a HPLC uh, column in uh, more of a plastic. Okay, it's a PTFE, it's not really, it's type of a plastic, but more on a plastic column. Okay, so, and um, this is still possible, but of course, uh, there's a theory behind it, there's a reasoning behind it, and um, I, I can't remember whether I put it in or not, but if, if it's in, then it's in, otherwise, this is just a basic information. Um, the two most basic type of column is one stainless steel and the other one is more of, of, of a plastic um, tubing. All right. So um, a column can be characterized based on this feature. Okay, number one is the hardware itself. Okay, um, stainless steel or PEK. So it's the material, <coughs> the, the poly material names, PEK, um, the modes, um, normally there's two modes that you consider uh, for basic use okay so there are of course more than one more than two modes but the most common modes that you will use um, or either you will use or, or people use are what we call as normal phase um, normal phase uh, NPC so normal phase chromatography or NP just a normal phase as abbreviated there um, reverse phase RPC, reverse phase chromatography, or just RP for reverse phase. Okay, so these two are the main ones. But you can also have um, different ones like ion exchange, uh, size exclusion, and whatnot. And these are generally the basic or, or similar principle to just a column chromatography that um, you learned um, during your degree. Okay, so pretty much whatever you learn about chromatography can be converted into um, a high performance um, liquid chromatography. So whatever you have over there, you can actually convert it um, into a more modern um, technique. So there's there's no difference between the principle behind it, the theory behind it. They are all identical. Um, so that's that's what I mean by I, I won't be covering about all these you know fine tuning theories that you have learned. So I'm just focusing on HPLC itself. Okay. Uh, you can also characterize the column based on the dimension, uh, the length, the width, the internal diameter, the outer, uh, the outer diameter, um, different types of um, column. Okay, so you have uh, typically in, in my case, I would I would like to divide um, HPLC column to just three. Okay, so you have prep, semi prep, and analytical. So prep, semi prep, analytical. So uh, we'll touch about the differences between these three. Um, you, you also have um, one that we call as fast LC or fast liquid chromatography which is not being covered okay uh, I took out uh, I took down took out the material from um, previous years so I skip about fast LC if you are interested in fast LC then by all means um, you can find the information about fast, uh, um, fast LC you also have a micro LC again this is also not covered and a nano LC which is also not covered okay so the particular focus is on a general term about column chromatography and the materials and whatnot all right and finally the fourth one um, you can also characterize column based on the support types what do I mean by support types is basically the material inside the column itself 
<coughs> okay, so you can have silica, a polymer, a modified silica, a polymer, a zirconia, or a hybrid, a combination of uh, idea three, and and there's there's so many different types that uh, <laughs> I won't be able to cover at all, because if you were to to cover it, um, looking at all the chemistries or the specifics about um support types, <laughs> it'll probably take another a week or so to to actually cover all the materials. So. <clears throat> Um, so what we will look at is just more in general terms about um, uh, support types and and um, and yeah just just that's it <clears throat> okay so what we'll do next now um, for the coming slide we will look at all these four um, uh, characteristics uh, column characteristics in a bit more detail and um, I'm, I'm hoping that by that you you will learn something about um, a HPLC column. <clears throat> so general characteristics of a typical analytical column. So this one is just a more specific. Okay, so um, just touching, just a touching base uh, a bit here and there. So um, analytical column is the most widely used column, uh, especially in industry. So for those who are working in the industry, then you know what I'm talking about. Okay. For those who are not working in industry, um, normally industry use HPLC to do analytical um, chemistry. So what I mean by analytical chemistry is to look into a more detail on, uh, for example, doing a QA and QC, quality control and quality assurance of an end line or a material. Okay, so um, they normally do analytical. Uh, they are they normally you normally use analytical column. For preparative and semi-preparative column um, mentioned down here, it's more on a purification process. So, like when you are using um, the normal glass chromatography during uh, during your degree or probably if you use it in high school, right? I'm not sure. But when you are using those column, what you um, the focus is to separate. Remember, the focus is to separate a, a normal mixture. Um, and, and therefore, the same principle still applies for uh, preparative and semi-preparative. These two types of column are normally used to purify uh, materials, for, uh, purify a mixed material. Uh, in my case, what I'm not, I normally use, I, I'll normally use all these three columns, okay? So the analytical, preparative, and semi-preparative. And, and the way to use it is normally you start off with a preparative column. Uh, preparative column has and the bigger internal diameter and and normally it's, it's very long um, the, the ones that I normally use is 250 uh, millimeter that's that's a bit, uh, about 25 centimeter long column okay and it has the biggest internal diameter so when you have um, big internal diameter you have high void volume and when you have um, high void, void volume means that the uh, compound separation is not um, it's still okay but it's not as if you are using an analytical column so analytical column you have a very good separation you have a good resolution good sensitivity and whatnot um, and selectivity but a preparative column you do have all these compared to a normal um, glass column but of course it's it's a bit lacking in certain things, okay? But it serves its purpose, which is um, normally to separate um, complex mixture. In, in my case, um, I'm a synthetic peptide chemist. Um, so I synthesize my own peptides in my lab. So, you know, doing a lot, lot of synthesis, um, there's, there's a lot of impurities. And um, instead of using analytical columns straight away, as you will see next in the next few slides, whereby a analytical column can only accommodate like a very tiny amount of compound. So preparative column, um, you can introduce more compound uh, so that you can purify them. Okay. Um, and then um, the next phase, once you have used preparative column, you move into a semi-preparative column whereby the internal diameter, as mentioned over here, is smaller therefore you have a better resolution so in case if you still have a mix of compounds um, following your first um, 
um, preparative column uh, cleaning then you normally switch uh, you, you normally redo the uh, purification process using a semi preparative column which has a better resolution so now you can split um, impurities and the product of interest in a better um, uh, resolution okay and then once you have um, separate the um, compounds then you move to analytical column um, to look at the quality of the uh, compounds so if say um, in a spirit in a semi preparative column what you 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 will be you you were able to um, separate a single peak okay so this is just an example um, and of course being the internal diameter very big being a high volume the peak is also broad okay uh, and this concept has been covered uh, I'm hoping that you have covered it with Dr. Mugunda so normally it's broad so uh, that's why you always need to go back to um, analytical column for your QA or QC no, more, more of a QC of course okay to, to look at the uh, the quality of the peak so what might happen sometimes is that when you um, analyze it in an analytical column is the single peak be now becomes a double peak okay so if that happens then you know okay my peak is not pure enough so I need to um, either um, repurify my compound or just use it okay so there's there's two options that you can do um, you need to you need to repurify again in case if um, the compound on the left hand side and the right hand side of the peak are two totally different things so if one is compound A second one is uh, compound B which are not isomers at all then you definitely need to um, repurify so you can either go back to semi preparative column um, using a more um, I mentioned that so you can use a longer column um, to make sure that you have a better resolution or um, sometimes what I even do is that you use an analytical column to actually purify a compound but of course it, it will take a long time um, and we will look at it um, some of the information soon okay so these are some examples uh, and, and I mentioned that you know sometimes even if you have two peaks you can and still use it um, that one is um, up to the um, further analysis so you can for example if the two peaks are uh, a chim uh, uh, chiral compound chimera compound I was, <laughs> I was about to mention about a chimera okay so if the compound are chiral compound meaning that they are um, an, an isomer and that um, for the purpose of the synthesis the chirality does not matter then of course you can you know you don't have to purify until you separate um, the chiral compounds okay because sometimes what happens in chiral compound is there are some equilibrium between these two compounds so if you separate them they will still convert into a chiral compound so it's better for sometimes to just combine them in in one uh, pot and use it for whatever reason that you want but of course if you are synthesizing uh, or you are analyzing a, a, a biomolecule a drug a candidate drug for example then of course you need to separate them before you actually um, use that use use the compound in an animal model or cell model or whatever okay <clears throat> that's that's just a general overview about um, different types of column all right so moving back to the lecture slides um, analytical columns are normally normal phase or reverse phase chromatography or can also have a size attrition chromatography in case of biology there's a lot of um, you know protein synthesis for example so you normally use SEC instead of using a normal analytical or preparative or semi preparative because proteins are a huge um, molecules or micro molecules are very huge so sometimes it's easier to use a size exclusion because you know size exclusion based on the theory and whatnot um, you can actually elute the uh, protein very very quickly all right um, so you can also have an IC um, column and whatnot. Um, so these are some types of analytical column um, and of course you can have the same uh, material inside a preparative and semi-preparative column as well. 
Okay, analytical column normally is between uh, 5 mm to uh, 50 mm to 250 mm long. So you can have either a very long analytical column. So of course, uh, based on the theory, the longer you have, um, the better is the resolution. <coughs> um, better the heat value. And this is related back to uh, Van der Meer um, equation. Okay. Um, but sometimes you just want a small a small column which has a very very small internal diameter which you know internal diameter packing material um particle size and whatnot because um the short one can also have the same impact as a longer column depending on the materials and whatnot we will cover about the materials soon. all right <coughs> um on this is the the particle size okay so this all of these are influences um, how you choose a column, what type of column is the best um, to choose from. Alright, so normally the short ones um, like this with a small internal diameter and with a small particle size are normally used for um, UHPLC, we call it as UHPLC. So the U there stands for ultra, meaning that um, HPLC a high performance, uh, it's a better version of a liquid chromatography now you have U, which is a better version of just HPLC. Okay, so um, if you do analytical column, you might actually have a UHPLC system um, in, in the company that you work at instead of just a normal HPLC. I'm not going to touch about the differences in very fine detail or not. Okay, so today just focus is just column. <coughs> and, and typical flow rate for an, an analytical column is between 0 0.1 to to a uh, mil per minute okay um mobile face operating pressure or, or back pressure operating pressure or back pressure of between 500 psi to about 3000 or um, some equipment can can handle 6000 psi okay of course depending on the brand and because of the modern modernization of the technology um if I'm not mistaken, there are pumps that can handle up to 20,000 PSI nowadays and it's normally used for this system, UHPLC system. Okay, so it's a very, very good instrument in terms of um, analysis or analytical uh, uh, perspective. Alright, so um, to show you an example of different sizes of column, um, this is um them okay so analytical column are normally short and small such as those ones okay so that one is something else we will cover about guard column later in in the slide of course um this one also looks like an analytical okay um preparative column is normally half of the size of this okay and this two is what i like to call as preparative column <coughs> the biggest one over here um, uh, can also be, be considered as an industrial level or a pre-industrial uh, uh, pre HPLC column because it's very huge and you can actually load like uh, I've used one of that before um, you, you can actually load like 50 to 100 grams of uh, material um, for like a very rough purification um, but in a normal R&D settings in in UM for example uh, I have yet to see anyone with this type of column because the price is so expensive one column uh, if I'm not mistaken last time is about um, 50,000 uh, 50, um, USD so <laughs> it's like buying a, a, a standard HPLC machine but you only get like one gigantic column okay um but yeah okay oh so i forgot to mention um i would split the lecture into uh hopefully two sections so one section is um will be about one hour to um one and a half hours uh, i will also have a break in the middle about 15 to half an hour and then uh, continue with another hour an hour lecture um, hoping for Right, so these are the a bit more detail about the differences between the columns. So underneath here are the categories um, that I mentioned. 
so you have analytical semi preparative of course it's going back that way all right so you have prep column and industrial prep column okay so the industrial prep is the one that i've shown before is the gigantic column um and um of course because of the different difference column that the the different columns that you can use um the pump system is also different and you need to use um, the the compatible pumps um with the column that that you want to use say for example um if you are to use an industrial pipe column of course you cannot use um a simple AC2080 um type pump because the pump can only uh pump a maximum of 10 mil per minute whilst um the preparative column might require like 50 mil per minute um solvent flow okay so there should be a compatibility between the whole system and of course if you were to use a UHPLC system UHPLC system has a lower uh, flow rate because the tubing is very very tiny um you don't need um you know a pump that is capable to pump say 100 or 150 mils per minute for a UHPLC system so you want it to be compatible um because otherwise you will lose some efficiency you will lose um resolutions and whatnot okay but <clears throat> this is just a uh, um like a figure summarizing um the differences between this type of column as you can see the internal diameter is different um the flow rate is different and not, and of course the material that you can um uh, separate inside the column are also different okay so the the smaller that you have um the, the smaller internal diameter um the smaller the void volume and therefore the smaller loading um material that you can have okay and in this one is three milligrams for example as compared to two grams uh, but the industrial column that i've used i've injected more than two grams um, sometimes we injected about 10 or 50 uh, grams to make sure that you know just do a quick run um, to remove or for example if you want to if in your system you know that the synthesis works almost to a 99 percent yield but uh, at the same time in the system you have a mix of say for example buffer um, and um, you know in HPLC system even though you can run buffer but sometimes you don't want to have a buffer you want to get a, a, a dry compound so if you have a buffer then you have a salt if you dry the system then you have a product plus salt uh, and to remove it to desaltate sometimes you just simply run it on industrial column um, because the industrial column can capture all the products um, but it will not capture the salts so the salts will just come out and now you can have a desalted, uh, desalted system run it through once remove all the salts and then you can just use uh, say for example 100% um, astonatural to elute all the compound you freeze dry it now you can get like a pure solid compounds Okay, so that's this is just an example of a uh, non typical use of a column chromatography. All right, so column hardware. So remember, um, in the past few slides, there are four categories that I mentioned. So one of the categories are column hardware. So we will look at this in in a bit more detail. What are the hardware? Because I know some of you guys have no experience about um HPLC. So this is just an introduction, like. By, by no means these are very detailed um, it's a little bit more detailed because this is a master level but it's not like very brief so a typical analytical column is made up from um, a standard steel tubing um, so far I have yet to see an analytical column from PEEK material PEK material so uh, so far all analytical column uh, is made up of um, steel stainless steel because of the high pressure uh, high back pressure that is being produced so um, you need to make sure that you can the system or the column can handle the high back pressure all right uh, with an od of uh, a quarter of an inch um, with end fitting allowing connection to one sixteenth of an od tubing so tubings and whatnot um, i'm not gonna touch about it a lot because 
it varies okay it simply varies um, if I were to say that it's always like this it's actually wrong because depending on the system that you have you might have a different um, OD tubings and whatnot but this is just a typical okay that's why I put it at a typical uh, because otherwise there's so many variables um, and the packing is held so this packing so column packing so this is our the silica imagine that these are the silica um, gels that you prepare okay so the the material the packing material or um, okay so the the packing material um, the packing is held in place with a set of uh, between 0.5 to 2 micron uh, porous frit so you have frit at the end there okay and uh, for more corrosion and resistance the stainless steel column hardware can be replaced by uh, a pig material so can be replaced doesn't mean that normally they will replace it so so far um, if you replace it of course um, the back pressure um, now uh, the column now cannot um, handle high back pressure so normally people will just use it still even though it's a bit more expensive than um, just a pig um, column but it's more resistance in, in terms of high back pressure so there are a lot of things that you need to consider corrosion, corrosion resistance for example um, then people use peak but in my case to reduce corrosion what I do is wash the column so each time after you use you need to wash your column um, using organic solvent of course because if you use aqua solvent then it still promotes um, corrosion okay so that's that's a typical uh, when you have an end fitting like this, if you look at the um, real image, um, if I were to zoom, okay, so these things, everything over here is called as the end fitting. Okay, and the column uh, and the beads, the packing material are inside, just these ones. And then another one, uh, at the other end you also have another end fitting. Um, because as mentioned here, um, the end fitting will be connected with um, a different tubing. Okay, so connects into a tube for the whole system. We will see probably in, uh, next week. I will do a quick um, overview of a real HPLC system um, because now we we are in PKP again. So um, I I cannot simply go into the lab and and do my recordings. I need to do to go through a lot of procedures to apply to attend uh, to enter the lab and whatnot so uh, i do not prepare any recording hplc recording today um, but i'm hoping that I, I will um have time to actually record it and and for those who have yet or, or who have not had the experience working with um, hplc system you can actually watch this video to look at oh this is this, this is that right <coughs> but um okay so um so this one is a column hardware talking about a gut column so why do we need to have a gut column and what is a gut column so of course to introduce a new uh, module and or add add on module to a column there must be a reason there must be a problem so over here the problem is normally okay particles collected in each PLC column inlet freight so remember the the freight initially at the beginning of the column before reaching um, the uh, packing material okay in the first millimeter of the pack bed um, so particles here means that they are bad particles so they can be particles active particles for example if you are doing um, a synthetic um, uh, a synthetic of something okay so normally you create radicals um, during your synthesis so these are the particles mentioned over here okay these particles are very active even though they are not um, even though they, they might not be a radical but uh, you know it, it can be reactive nonetheless and um, and therefore normally these particles will be collected at the very beginning of the column inlet okay at the very beginning there and and this usually results in damage to the column um, reduce in efficiency and whatnot okay uh, this variable column are usually discarded to avoid degradation of analysis such as peak tailing uh, split peaks as well as high back pressure so if you are working in an industry whereby 
um, the purpose of your company is to do a QA QC alright so you need to make sure that all your equipments are of course calibrated you need to have um, uh, probably ISO and whatnot um, but you also need to make sure that your column which is the the the, the main component of uh, an HPLC is at the best condition so you don't want to have a column that is damaged because otherwise um, you will get these things you know? so peak training peak splitting splitting a very high back pressure that your system cannot support so it's still run all together you, so you don't want this so th th these are some of the problems that requires um, what we call as gut column and we will look at the gut column in more detail after this okay um, and and to understand about peak tailing peak split it, uh, splitting uh, high back pressure and whatnot go back to your GC lecture again uh, because I know Dr. Mungun have covered this a little bit so go back and refresh your memory okay so another source of problem uh, irre irreversible bond to the stationary phase so um, or the packing material uh, we will look at this in more detail when we uh, reaches I think for I'm mistaken it's on lecture number f uh, slide number 14 currently we are only at <laughs> slide number 12 so there's there's a long way to go okay we will look at how this can uh, how is this possible and and because of this uh, possibility um, gut column is being introduced okay so instrument downtown can uh, occur of course if you damage your column if you see peak, uh, peak, peak splitting and whatnot based on your uh, controls um, therefore you definitely need to stop the instrument you need to analyze what went wrong or what is the problem and therefore fixing um, an instrument downtown down uh, time can be very costly to a lab or your company okay so you need to make sure that um, you understand this to avoid it from happening <clears throat> okay so a HPLC gut column in the form of cartridges so these are the gut column in the form of cartridge so individual column are installed in front of analytical semi prep, prep column in order to protect it from um, as I mentioned there, the, the problems uh, that, that uh, was shown in the previous slide. So this is your column, okay? You have your frit somewhere in the middle there. And you have your fitting. And then instead of connecting um, HPLC tubing directly to the um, uh, fitting, so you fit it with a gut column, okay? And this gut column contains um, gut cartridges and normally this gut cartridge has the same packing material as your column okay because if you know that the material will react to your column so it will react to this uh, gut column first and the advantage of a gut column is you can easily open it and replace the cartridge with a new clean one so by doing this you uh, have now um, save yourself from spending too much money um, in replacing the column so a typical analytical column C18 um, costs roughly about um, 2,500 ringgit okay of course you can get a, a, a better version and the cost is higher so say for example the cost is 2,500 um, a typical gut column like this only costs like 250 and then you will get like three uh, cartridges okay for example um, so now you know that you know replacing the cartridge are actually a cheaper version than replacing a damaged column so um, even for my case um, so this whole set of course is not just 250 um, it's more than that but um, in the long run you can actually save more money okay so um, that's why typically you will definitely use a gut column especially if you are using you're running an analytical business if you're running a business normally you will have a gut column uh, because it's um, kind of like you know an investment to save more money in the future all right so other than that other than a gut column a typical gut column that you attach on to a typical HPLC column what else can you do to protect your column so the first one you can always filter that okay so you will need to always filter um, your samples before running 
why because um as i mentioned um uh, as we will see um in the next um few slides or so is that each column has its own void volume okay uh, and this void volume comes from um the 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 spaces between um columns right? and this should be a basic theory of uh, column cryptography and so i don't have that in um as a slide here but just to mention about it so imagine that you have your column like this and then you have your particle beads okay so what is void volume void volume are the spaces in the middle of the particles here okay and these spaces um, allows for your materials to move through uh, say for example if you have um, compound a so compound a will passes through all of this void volume uh, from this section to that section so if you have particle a and particle b because um, particle a and b has different characteristics for example if that one is an acid and particle a is a base for example so you now have a different interaction with your column and um, due to this uh, different interaction then you can separate your compound so basic principle of chromatography um, but without having a void volume this material cannot pass through from point uh, y to point z so it cannot move through these points so you need to have a void volume uh, so that there are spaces where the molecule can move through <coughs> and of course um, the void volume is normally small you don't want to have a very big vo void volume because the bigger the void volume the less interaction between your a column particle and the material that you want to purify okay so you want small volume but not zero you want small um, so if you have a small volume but in your sample itself you have large particle so what will happen as you predict if you have large particles in a small void volume the particle can block um, the void volume okay this can happen uh, and this happens a lot and therefore, what you do is you normally filter. So you filter your sample first to make sure that you remove all these uh, big impurities or big particles. So that when you when you put it into the system, then voila, everything runs uh, perfectly. Okay, that's one way to do it. Second way, um, instead of well, not not instead of okay while also filtering um, your sample what you can also do is filtering your mobile feces okay uh, why do you need to filter it because um, in an organic solvent for example you can have micro sieves okay if you have uh, ever purchased or have used an organic solvent sometimes when you what you have in the bottle because i'm not in the lab otherwise normally i will show you what are micro sieves and whatnot Okay, I'm hoping that you know about micro sieve. If you don't know about micro sieve, then you can Google it. So micro sieve is used to trap um, um, some molecules. Okay, depending on the size and whatnot, depending on the material, so you can trap um, water, for example. Okay, uh, in your organic solvent. So sometimes you use micro sieve. And, and because um, now it's not in your sample, so you do not filter it like this. And it's a solvent for your system, so you need to have, you, you need to use a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of volumes, basically. So you don't want to filter it one by one until you get like, you know, 10, 10 liters or not, or might not. So what you do is you just use the solvent, but you have a filter at the very beginning of the tubing. Okay, so the inlet tubing. So this is the solvent flow. That one will be connected into um, the degasser. Degasser system. So you, you don't want to introduce uh, particles into your um, solvents. Because now, if you have removed all the particles from your samples, you don't want to introduce another particle somewhere else. So what you do is normally you have a filter at the very beginning of uh, your HPLC inlet tubing, solvent tubing. So that you can remove all these particles okay big particles of course i'm not talking about and um, the dissolved particles these are all um, big particles that might clot your column 
Okay, or your system every anywhere. Um, so, in a good example is as shown here. So this is a, a filter at the very begin at the very end. So it's kind of like uh, having the glass free. You remember when you do a filtration, um, sample filtration for example. Um, one way is to use a filter paper. Second way is to have a a, a frit, uh, frit funnel, fritted funnel. So um, it's the same concept. So you can use you can have a fritted um, filter at the very beginning of your HPLC column, um, either a fritted or um, this is another a uh, different types whereby you have a metal frit instead of a glass frit. You have a metal frit, which is you know better resistance. Um, against uh, breakages and whatnot. Okay, because it's made of of stainless steel. So these are two additional things that you normally have in your HPLC system to make sure um, that your, of course, the primary reason is to make sure that your column is safe from um, damage. Okay, so you can have either a guard column that you attach before the column you uh, can have a good practice of filtering your samples before introducing it to a HPLC system or and also you can have a filter um, at the very beginning of your uh, mobile phases All right. <clears throat> and of course if you don't have uh, extra money because that guy over there is is rather expensive if you need to replace it so frequent um, as a company, you might not want to do that. Uh, you you might want to have one fleet that can last for like six months or a year before you want to replace it. You don't want to keep on replacing it because it's being clawed by micro sieves. So what you can also do is now a pre-filter, a pre-filter all your mobile phases before you put it into another filter. So now you, you, you have a contingency plan whereby the filter over here is much cheaper than using that filter that I've shown you in the previous slide. Okay, so this is a good practice. Um, even though in UM we do not have this practice, at least in my lab, we do not have this practice yet. Uh, because you know I just joined UM three years ago. Um, so and and currently I'm not a heavy user of HPLC system. But once I am in the future when I have more students and, and there will be a high um con uh, usage of the HPLC system then definitely out this will be introduced so you will filter the solvent first before you put the solvent into another filter to make sure that your system is free from any particles okay uh, and of course because that one is just a, a filter um, you know a paper filter or it's kind of like it can be a paper or it can be a polymer depending on what solvent you want to filter um, so you can have a, a different materials um, to use as a filter so if you have something like this now you, you can already make sure that there are the solvents in the mobile phase now are free from particles and to double contain if there's any issues then you have another filter at the beginning of your HPLC system okay so these are some of the contingency plan that you can have to make sure that your um, column are safe from any damage okay damage in terms of particles of course <clears throat> I will just pause this video for a few minutes. I want to drink first and I will all right I'm back um so next one about column hardware what we will look at is the modes um generally h p l c runs into two modes as I mentioned, so one is normal phase, the second one is the reverse phase so for those who forgotten about normal phase or uh, normal phase I have um put it there. So a normal phase is kind of like similar on when you are running a normal, uh, very typical um, glass uh, or open column, open open column or glass column. Remember, if you have a glass column with um, silica in there. Um, why did I write down polar column? I have no idea about polar column. <laughs> okay, I was probably thinking about something else. But anyway, a reverse phase is. Oh, now I remember. What do I mean by polar column? Okay, so a polar column means that um, the materials that you use, okay, this refers to the materials. 
that you use inside the column so a normal silica column is um, by have using a silica um, dioxide or what you have is um, you have a cyanol on the surface of the particles so in case if that one is uh, silicon oxide on the surface you will have um, a lot of cyanol si and then oh okay this is what i mean by a polar a polar surface a polar column it's not really a polar column it's a polar particles but yeah so probably I change that to particles okay so a polar particles um, is when you have a normal phase and the, the stationary phase are normally a polar particle but in a reverse phase system um, you will normally use a, a polar uh, in combination with an organic uh, mobile phase but the particle itself uh, the stationary phase the stationary phase is normally non-polar so instead of having um, a, a sinol um, surface okay of course this one is connected to a network of silica forming the particle <coughs> so instead of having a, a, a hydroxyl functional group as a surface um, what you will do is you will modify it with um, some some other materials for example like um, a long chain um, lipids okay uh, and if say the carbon length is c18 then once you modify the surface c18 okay so you will now call the column as a reverse phase column with a c18 um, label attached to it again uh, because the recording is at home i do not have a column but otherwise i can show you the column so you can simply just google it Okay, just Google um, typical column, then you can see there's a lot of uh, variation, um, uh, modification, not variation, a lot of modification can, that can be done on the column. I do have some examples in the next few slides. When we reach there, then, then we will probably talk about it in, in, in more detail. Okay, and of course, we have other types of column, iron exchange, for example, such as exclusion, or even a chiral column. Okay, so chiral column, um, as I mentioned, if you have two peaks like that when you do analytical, so you can actually have a chiral column to actually separate if they are isomers. Of course, a, a chiral isomer. <clears throat> Alright, so um, reverse phase. Um, okay, so since reverse phase chromatography is used in 70 or 80% of all HPIC applications, um, reverse phase column for small molecules are the focus of uh, this discussion so in the next few slides and in the next slides until the end the main focus is reverse phase so in case if whatever I said makes you confused please remember this slide okay this slide is saying that uh, the examples that I will use uh, mostly in, in the next examples are from the reverse phase HPLC system, okay, or well, uh, so to say, reverse phase HPLC column, all right, because it has a wider application and whatnot, and and the the main reason why uh, reverse phase is um, mostly used is because if you were to run a normal phase, you can still go back to a normal column, okay, so you can always go back to that one. Uh, a standard ones even though it takes longer time and whatnot but there are some advantages of using that uh, typical column compared to HPLC so um, and, and of course for analysis purposes um, reverse phase um, columns nowadays has so many uh, I, I would say uh, different variations so regardless of whether your molecules are very polar or very non-polar you can always switch between columns to make sure that you can get like a beautiful um, uh, spectral, uh, spectrum okay, for your compounds alright so, um, so we, we have covered the first one um, about column hardware um, about modes okay, so the second one is about dimension okay, the column hardware dimension so what I mean by dimension here is two things one is the length okay and the second one is the width also um, 
So this one is pretty much the diameter. Okay, so you have a cylindrical. Ima imagine that you have a cylindrical cylindrical column like this. This is a blow up, of course. So one you have you you have the length, and second one you have the um, diameter. So not not just the outer diameter, because outer diameter is just the um, the size of the column, but What's important is the internal diameter because this internal diameter um, is what holds the um, uh, packing materials and um, this packing materials depending on the type, depending on the size, you will have different void volumes and void volumes influences the separation capability of your column. <coughs> Okay, so column dimension, length, and column internal diameter or ID. So sometimes you will see this abbreviation, sometimes you will see ID abbreviation. So I'm just talking about internal diameter, but of course I will see if if I were to see ID means internal diameter. Okay, so these two um dimensions influences the control on the performance of the column. So remember N in Van der Meer equation. N is the plate number, okay. The speed of um the speed of your run. So what do I mean by speed of run is that um, say for example if you are using an analytical column, a very short ones, okay, one run might take you like five minutes, but if you have a very long one, the two hundred fifty mils, so one run might take you about half an hour or forty minutes. Um, before you can inject another sample for another run, okay. So this is what I mean by speed. Sensitivity, of course. Um, the longer the column, normally it's more sensitive, so um, you can get a better separation and whatnot. But that's not always the case because it depends on the materials, and uh, in the packing materials itself. So, um, but if say you have a similar packing materials, um, but you just vary the uh, column length. Um, and of course, you can get a better sensitivity the longer your column is. Again, it relates back to Van der Meer equation. Okay, because Van der Meer equation, plate number, plate number, sensitivity, resolutions, and whatnot. Okay, and of course, uh, sample capacity. Um, the bigger the OD, <coughs> the more compounds that you can uh, put in to uh, analyze. So, sample capacity. If you remember, if you go back to slide number uh, 10, yeah, I'll probably just go in here. So the bigger the ID, internal diameter, the more sample you can actually put in uh, per column. Okay. Now, where were we? We were at number 18. All right. And these are figure, uh, uh, table 2.1 is just an example of um, different types of column. So. You have the main three types that I always mention, so you can just ignore that one for for now. Okay, so this, the other ones are just uh, for interest. This is not an advanced HPLC class that you will learn about everything. No, um, so because as as I mentioned before the start of the class, we do have a quite wide background of people who know HPLC who have worked with HPLC and whatnot. So. Uh, I apologize for the advanced user. We're not going to talk about all these other advanced material. We're just focusing on the triple, uh, three main types: is preparative, semi-preparative, and conventional or um, analytical um, column. Okay, see a typical ID. So internal diameter, all right? Preparative is the biggest, semi-prep, medium, and then conventional is um small, the smallest. Okay, but of course you can have a smaller ones. And even a nano LC, even though they call it nano LC, I, I just like to, you know, combine everything as analytical because when you use a nano LC, you cannot use it for purification purposes. It normally goes back to analysis. Okay, so I like to combine all that, uh, as an analytical column. Okay, the analytical branding. All right, and and also you can see here a typical flow. Um, the faster the flow, and of course, um, you know you need to make sure that the flow. It it doesn't mean that if you have a big column, you have the choice to make sure the flow is low. No, 
Okay, because two is the end. In fact, it influences the void volume. Say, for example, for a preparative column, you have a big internal diameter, and the internal diameter volume, for example, is two mils. Okay. Um. Yeah. The internal diameter void volume. So this is a uh of, this is pretty much a theoretical perspective. Okay. A theoretical perspective, hundred percent. If say the void volume is ten mils, okay. Of course, when you want to run your your system, a typical flow rate, you cannot go lower than ten mils, or even if you actually run it at ten mils, uh, and having a void volume of ten mils, it will take one minute for the compounds to actually or for the solvents. Not we're not talking about the compounds at all. We're talking about the solvents. For the solvents to travel from one end to another, it will take you one minute. Okay, so it's very very inefficient, uh, if you do have something like that. So if your void volume is big, uh, ten mils, for example, your flow rate might be six times or even ten times faster than that. So void volume is ten, you might want to have flow rate of a hundred mils per minute. Okay, so that you can uh, make sure the solvent flows. Rather quickly in the system, because the faster the solvent flows, the faster you can separate your uh, compounds. Okay, it's very unfortunate. This is my column. All right, uh, <clears throat> and again, this this is the um, corresponding. If you have a flow rate like this, normally you have a what uh, what volume of that much. Um, and even though it says here what volume is bigger, um. Normally, you you want your flow rate to be uh, faster than your void volume, because otherwise there's no purpose of having an interaction between your um, um within your column itself. Um. So yes, this is a guide. Um, and and I mentioned you you want to always have a flow rate that is higher than your void volume, but typically that's. Well, it's, it's, it depends on how you use it. In, in my case, I normally want to have a, a flow rate that is either equal or greater than the void volume so that um, the time span for my separation is not too long. Uh, but again, it depends on your system. If your HPLC system can actually accommodate that uh, high flow rate, by all means, uh, you can. But if not, you know, just simply avoid it. Um, and of course, uh, the internal diameter, the bigger the internal diameter, the more compounds that you can uh, have. <coughs> so, column length determine column efficiency and the analysis of the speed. Okay, um, just an equation, the plate number equals to L over H. L is the column length, H is the peak height. Okay, um, longer column have higher plate number and yield better resolution with longer analysis time. So this is an example of um, the same um, column, okay, the same material, so it has a C18. Um, this is what I mean by the surface also modified with a long alkyl chain, so C18 for example. And um, what was changed here, so everything else is kept constant, um, including the flow rate, so the flow rate is kept at 2 mils per minute. What was changed is just the column length. Okay, and as you see here, the longer the column, the better the separation because you have a higher plate number, right? As simple as that. <clears throat> so for a simple mixture, a short column might be sufficient. Might be sufficient. Okay, again, it depends on on um the uh, simple mixture so it might be simple but then the compound is, uh, is almost identical that you still require a long column to separate uh -huh. but in case if uh, you only have like two mixture so one is you know is very huge or is very polar the other one is uh, totally opposite to the uh, the the first material that you want so a shorter column might yield um, sufficient resolution and it also gives you a, a shorter analysis time because towards the end of the day, if you are a company, analysis time influences one volume of the solvents that you use for HPLC. 
So the more solvent, the more cost. Okay, so you want to make sure that your time is quite short. We will look at um, method development uh, next week. Okay, we will talk about this in, in more detail. <coughs> so you, you want to have a faster analysis, but at the same time, it gives you sufficient resolution. So meaning that there's no double peak, the peak are not broad, um, and whatnot. Okay. And based on the equation, since uh, the plate number is an addition, so it's an additive, the longer column you have, the uh, the more plate number that, that you will get. Okay. Columns can be connected to one another to produce high efficiency separation. Okay. You can simply have two columns and just combine them together. Especially in a case where the budget is very limited. Say for example, um, in year 2020, you have the budget to buy one column. In year 2021, you have another budget just to buy one column. So to buy a big, uh, a long column straight away, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough funding. So what you can do is now you can combine these two columns together using this connector over here. Okay, so this one is just a blow up picture. Um, but this one is basically you have one column attached to one side and then you have another column attaching to the other side then you now have increased the plate number and therefore increase the uh, efficiency or the resolution um, of your column <coughs> however however you need to remember that you will now have longer um, analysis time and of course the sensitivity might be lower due to sample dilution so you have a longer column you might dilute the sample even more so the re the sensitivity now becomes slower so you need to now make sure that you have a good detector a good detector even if you have lower ro uh, lower resolution or lower sensitivity you can still detect your compound that is what's important <coughs> Alright, so now we go into a bit more detail about the material or the support type, okay, or the stationary phase. Um, materials, or I uh, mentioned previously, is the packing materials. Materials, or uh, support type, packing material, or the stationary phase. Okay, <coughs> so the nature. And characteristic, what do I mean by nature is um, the surface, the functional groups, for example, okay, um, the polarity. So those, uh, those are the words um, that can define nature. Characteristics, as you see, we have um, spherical, we have uh, a more monolith layer and whatnot. So we will go through this. So the nature and characteristics of column packing materials, okay, uh, is critical for the column performance. So different materials that you use will definitely influence a column performance. And we will see some examples in the next few slides. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the common ones that we, um, are available um, nowadays, but by all means, these are not limited. There are so many uh, different types of column nowadays that I probably will not be able to list it down um, over here because we have three main companies that produces three different columns and also we have a smaller companies that produces extra columns um, and, and therefore these are just some of, of the examples uh, of a typically used um, column materials okay so um, the first one for a reverse phase normally you will see these words okay C18 C8 uh, of course it's not listed here but normally what I use is C4 um, and the materials are just like that. So you can see um, the, the silica attached to a carbon. Okay, so for a reverse phase, a carbon. Well, octal, 8 carbons. Um, C18, of course, 18 carbons. You can have a cyano group um, attached to um, the, the silica head, or uh, the cyanol now is being replaced by um, a cyanol replaced by a cyano. We can have a phenyl, so instead of uh, again cyanol, which is a polar being replaced into a non-polar component, therefore creating a reverse phase chromatography. Okay, and of course, 
you can have a polar um, replacing another polar okay so polar it says here polar embedded meaning that it's still polar um, it's still non-polar so you can use it for reverse phase but you have a polar uh, entity embedded within the column itself okay and, and a normal um, phase chromatography you have a silica with a cyanol group of course these are the basic general ones you can also substitute that with an amino group at the very end okay so you, you cannot simply directly um, substitute um, the hydroxyl group with amine so you need to have a little bit of an um, alkyl chain before you can introduce another functional groups you can also have ion exchange uh, whereby you now have a polar charge um, uh, entity okay um, a carboxy methyl for example the AEA, SAX and so on and so forth so these are some of the examples of different types of columns so these are what I mean by the nature it can also be the characteristics it doesn't matter okay so what you need to understand is that depending on the functional groups um, of the packet materials you can have different effects so in case if you were to buy um, a column for a specific use these are the things that you need to actually do and, and do a little bit of research um, so that you, you can um, you know know what you are what you want okay which is very tedious because you have so many companies so many different type of columns and these are just the support types I'm not talking about the synthesis and whatnot so there are so many variables that you can choose from and therefore will not be covered 100% in this lecture okay all right so um, another example support type we can have a silica so this one is more general so that one is more specific the previous slide is more specific examples um, but more general ones is you can have a silica base you can have a polymer base you can have a hybrid of those two polymer and silica um, you can have a, a surface function groups different types of surface function groups or um, uh, what's called here is bonded groups okay it's a surface it doesn't matter the terminology that you use in 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 case if i were to ask this in uh, or, or in case if you are using this terminology <coughs> in your uh, assignment or during your final exam it's fine okay you you can you can interchange the terminology as long as i understand what you are talking about okay so you can have c18 c4 c3 amino cyano and blah 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 okay a lot of different types um of course <clears throat> you can also have a different particle size so you can have two microns three microns five microns or even 10 microns or even 20 microns uh, the cheapest one of particle size and of course as i mentioned particle size influence the void volume and therefore influence the resolution and it's not just that you can have a different pore size what do i mean by that so now you have one particle okay Say for example you have one particle over here with the length of two microns for example these particles even though in drawings we like to draw it as a spherical uh, but in reality they are not exactly spherical they are actually um, spaces or pores um, inside it okay because again this is not salts whereby you can have a cube shape with a um, what do you call it um, even surface or like a very smooth surface so silica particles normally form like a network so you have pore size so pore size can uh, differentiate or uh, can differ can varies from uh, not just 60 you can actually have I can't remember if I'm not mistaken you can have a lower one so, but I can't remember the exact value on top of my head but written here is you can have 60 to 200 uh, m strong pore size so um, these dots okay if you blow up the dots you can have um, so that one is the silica networking okay so that one is the silica network probably I should have write down SiO2 okay silica network and then these are the pores and the size of this pores also influence the column okay why the bigger but when talking about void volume it's not 
just about the spaces between the particles but also the space inside the particle so um, the bigger the pore size the more surface area that you will have so you have a bigger void volume and lower resolution okay so relationship um, of course you can talk about sensitivity and whatnot but we'll, we'll just stop there okay so these are some of the characteristics of the support types and of course um, this will influence the um, efficiency of the column so if say uh, your company wants to buy um, a new column you need to reconsider all of these okay whether you want to have the best of the best which is fine but of course it comes with a price it comes at a price so the better the column the more the more expensive the column is so sometimes it's better <coughs> for you to just have um, a moderate um, efficiency column efficiency but you have multiple or different types of column so that you can do a comparison between two different columns um, as a control or as a QC or quality control for whatever you wanted to do okay all right <coughs> silica support is the most abundant and widely used as, as I showed you in the previous slide <coughs> sorry these are the most abundant use um, in a liquid chromatography um, arena okay and unbonded columns are rarely used um, nowadays um, of course you still use it for the glass open column because the materials that you use or uh, the silica gel that you use is a lot more than in a specifically in a column okay so it's rarely rarely used especially for analytical column because um, the internal diameter is very small the material is very little so you don't want to damage the the material again because if you damage it then you'll get peak bodily split, split, uh, splitting and whatnot okay so that's why i mentioned here unbonded silica are rarely used for analytical purposes you might still use it for preparative because preparative uh, column is for uh, sample purification it's not for quality controls okay you don't use it because strong absorptive characteristics it's not just about absorptive characteristics you can have uh, a reaction going on between um, the uh, silica particles and your compound thus rendering your column inefficient okay the cyanol groups which is the functional groups in the silica support uh, found on silica surface are typically bonded um, modified with bonding reagents to create a hydrophobic or liquid like uh, stationary phase for reverse phase application so this one is this sentence is specifically for reverse phase okay of course as as shown uh, previously you can have a polar surface um, to um, to create a column that has the ion exchange capability or you can use different materials to create a column that has a surface um, uh, size differences characteristics so there's there's a lot of variations so these are just one example um, uh, typically for reverse phase you have the cyanide groups reacting with another we call it as bonding reagent uh, to change the surface uh, type okay residual cyanides remaining after the bonding steps are further reacted with a smaller silane or end cap to reduce the number of these exotic sites so what i mean by exotic types sites you you will see more detail um, after this slide is the sioh so because this one is polar and a hydroxyl group are very reactive so you can react it with a lot of compounds so this is what i mean by it's being encapped to remove this so simplest way to end cap is just by using a methanol so you can have a metal group over there so now you no longer have um, a cyanol group okay uh, if you have a, met a metal group then the metal group is you know less reactive than if you do have a cyanol group okay so some examples in, in more detail okay um the ones that i've highlighted and bold are critical to remember 
because it will be reflected again um, in the different slides but for now just look at this what do I mean by modification of the signal group all right so these are the typical ones so the typical um, silica gel that is mentioned is normally have a silica surface or cyanol surface this one S I O H the cyanol surface so to make sure that um, the column is no longer reactive meaning that you cannot form any chemical reaction on top of that a bonding reagent such as octidimethyl silane is used okay so to create this one is one two three octyl is eight one two three four five six seven eight okay to create now what you call as C8 column all right so now you reduce from say three uh, cyanon groups after your reacted it with the octidimethyl uh, silane now you only have one um, reactive um, cyanol and um, this one reactive cyanol can be further reacted with um, trimethyl silane for example as an end capping um, option so now you don't have any cyanol group or active cyanol group uh, or altogether so less damage to your column all right <coughs> And of course, you, you don't want to have a cyanol group not just because of um, um, a reaction that can occur between your um, reagents or your materials with the column. Okay, okay? so that's not just the, the primary reason. The, the second reason is because if you do have um, uh, other uh, substituent reacting at, um, at this particular cyanol groups, what you have now is you are changing the characteristics of the column. Okay, so for example, what you want is a C18 uh, non-polar column. If you leave it there and it reacts with um, something that might have a charge, right? And now you are changing, or you you are changing the column nature from a, a totally reverse phase C8 into a, uh, I don't know <laughs> what what should I call it. Um, ion exchange C8 column okay you, you might want to do that but uh, so far I have yet to see if that type of column actually exists okay <clears throat> and now when you're talking about the silica column itself um, there are some limitations uh, for example the operating pH range um, ranges from 2 to 8 if you go too low you might uh, reactivate um, the cyanol groups for example um, or if you go too high then the, the silica will just decompose okay again remember this one the silica particles even though we are uh, you know talking about solid silica particles but they can still react okay they are still reactive to a certain degree of course it's not very very reactive but they are still reactive so for a long um, usage then you know you might get a variation all right so it's already one and a half hours uh, i will stop here so this is part one um, then i will continue with uh, another slide i'll probably put a link down somewhere here or somewhere on my on, on my face i will put it here so they can just click on the link to move to the second part all right cheers